So I'm Ann Duong. I'm currently at NYU, um, but prior to that, I was CT director at um, Emory um, for eight or nine years. And then I moved to the University of Utah, where I was also the CT director. I was also the um, quality um, medical quality director at Emory when I was there. So I'm going to talk about managing a large CT department. And I know that there's a lot of consolidation happening um, in our uh, in, in hospitals. And so departments seem to be getting larger and larger, and it's getting harder to manage um, our uh, uh, departments. So I have no disclosures. And as I said, we're in a time where um, out, coming out of the pandemic where we're, there's a perception that there's a lot of work. And I think there is a lot of work. We are, um, volumes have bounced back since the pandemic. And so our volumes keep increasing. And yet we feel the sense of lack of control over this growing volume. Um, there's also a sense, a smaller sense of community as we work more remotely and spend more time working um, with each other through um, electronic devices rather than in person. And then there's also a perception of the lack of transparency often in our very large institutions. And as I said, we keep growing. So I know NYU seems to add a new site every month or so. Um, when I was at Emory, we started out with 20 some odd scanners. And now I heard my um, former colleagues telling me that he's got 40 scanners to manage now. So um, things are definitely, our departments are definitely growing. Um, and with that, we have uh, to bring on new sites. There's going to be a lack of standardization between the sites. Um, there's some, um, we have a shortage of technologists, so we often have to take in travelers to meet the demand that we have. And then we have the issues with poor communication between our shifts and our work units and the difficulty of updating new protocols and procedures. And we all um, heard many people in this um, talk about how they went about doing that and the effort they had to put in to make that happen. And the impact then is on patient safety because things are different. Um, when we have different sites in different locations uh, doing different things, then we may not be doing the same uh, quality of imaging or the same um, types of safety procedures that we do in all of our sites. And it also affects staff safety because now they're managing a large volume. Often they're working by themselves and they really need the kind of support from the um, department to make sure that they're safe in their work. So how can we address some of these issues? I think some of the ways that we can address it is by um, providing greater transparency and communication, especially between, um, not only just between radiologists and technologists, but between different shifts and different locations. Um, we need to empower our staff to be able to change their working conditions uh, if they feel that something is unsafe. And we need to be able to clearly define how the work gets done and the expectations for the work that we do so that it's clear what needs to be done to meet the performance goals that we have. So I think the ideal way of doing this is completely changing how we manage um, people in medicine. And that goes from the very top to the bottom. Um, um, instead of a top-down approach, we really should be supporting our frontline staff and um, physicians to take care of our patients and do the things that are, provide them the resources and do the things that are necessary to make that happen. Um, and there are very few places that have this, have adopted this management model. Uh, one place that comes to mind is Virginia Mason um, that has this lean management strategy, but there are other places that are, are starting to convert to this type of um, management strategy. Um, namely, I know Stanford is working on it um, with David Larson now, uh, especially now that he's at the helm of the um, uh, the performance improvement for the entire um, hospital. Um, and places like Emory that was starting to do this as I um, um, at the end of my time there. So what I'm gonna talk about is a daily management system. And this is something that you can implement in your department. It doesn't have to be in the whole hospital, although it does. it is helpful if the whole hospital adopts the same strategy. And so my learning objectives for this talk today is to describe the benefits of the, a daily management system, identify the different components of a daily management system, and explain how standard work can improve safety and quality. 
So what is a daily management system? It's a day-to-day -day operational framework for leaders to engage with staff to solve problems on a continuous basis. So we're not waiting for things, um, for a sentinel event to happen. We're trying to get ahead of um, problems by trying to solve these problems that we come that come up on a day-to-day -day basis. And it helps facilitate communication and coordination within and across organizational units so that we can easily communicate to other units and other um, shifts. And this concept is now um, actually something we expect the residents to learn. I'm also on the um, uh, non-interpretive skills committee for the ABR. And um, this is an idea that we are trying to promote um, so that more people are aware that of this concept of daily management systems. So let's think about how you typically address a recurring problem or safety issue in your institution. So I think one thing that happens often is we have a problem that we think of, and then we um, send an email out to the supervisor saying, hey, I'm worried about this problem that's happening in CT. Um, can, we, can we address it? And so we wait to hear back, and sometimes we get a response back that says, I've talked to the tech, this, um, you know, I told them what was going on and, you know, try to make this not happen again. And in the meantime, sometimes it happens again because we didn't disseminate that information across the um, department. We just addressed this one issue. We didn't learn from this problem. So with a daily management system, what we're trying to do is bring those problems to the forefront and put make them visible every single day. Um, and then again, have the staff help to fix those problems and give them the resources and time to do that. And then the things that can't be fixed, because not everything, of course, is going to be able to be fixed by the people doing the work, those problems get escalated above to, um, to uh, management and to um, the higher levels. So at the very center of this idea of daily visual um, management system is the visibility board. So here's an example of a visibility board that I put in um, at the um, University of Utah. Um, and what this provides is transparency. So we have information about equipment that's not working um, and what we're going to do about it. So that provides that transparency. It communicates. So if the next um, uh, we usually have staggered staffing. So when the next staff member comes, if they miss the huddle, they can take a look at the board and see what happened, uh, what we talked about that day. Um, and then it also provides accountability. So we know who's going to address the problems that have come up um, and how we're going to fix it. So what this does, again, is it takes that individual knowledge. Like if you have a tech that knows that one of the equipment is broken, it takes that individual knowledge and brings it out into the, um, the public sphere so that other uh, people in that unit can, can uh, learn about that. Um, if you call, if you, if you know something's broken, you just call the tech, um, your uh, manager, then that's the only other person who may know about it. So how do we bring that information so that everybody knows? So the part of the daily management system is to have a steered, uh, um, a tiered structure uh, of structured huddles. So you have huddles at different levels of the organization, um, bringing information back and forth up to management and then down back down to the staff and physicians. So it usually starts with a daily readiness huddle. This is the huddle involving the frontline team, the um, people actually doing the work. Um, and it's uh, or it's also called a tier one huddle, and it starts. Um, uh, it's done every day at near list the start of a shift. Um, sometimes you can't do it right at the start of the shift because we have things that we need to do to prepare for the day. But you can start at um, at the beginning of the shift with a huddle. Um, you can identify. It helps you identify issues and escalate as necessary in that um, huddle, and then update any ongoing issues that are going on. Um, as well as provide staff information about their day, like the um, volume of studies that are scheduled for that day um, can be also put on this um, in this huddle. And important things that you have to have a, a um, process for is we need to have some ground rules during the huddle. 
Um, we need to make sure that that huddle is short. It's meant to be usually around 10 minutes and definitely less than 15. Um, the ground rules are usually written as a team so that you, interpersonal conflicts aren't mentioned usually in the huddle. We want to keep it to the daily work. And then there's some assigned roles and responsibilities during the huddle, a leader that runs the huddle, um, a recorder that writes down the information on the board, and a timekeeper so that we make sure that we are disciplined and um, keep that time to 10 or 15 minutes. When I start implementing a huddle system, most people will say, well, we don't have time to do this. Well, in the process of doing a huddle, you're bringing on um, or talking about the important things of your day, and it's only 10 minutes. I think we can wait um, 10 minutes and spend 10 minutes together to look at our day and see what things are um, we need to work on to make the day smoother. So some of the considerations when you're starting a huddle process is the location. This has to be at the place of work. If you put a huddle board in a room away from where people are working, they will never be able to make it there. Uh, so the, the huddle has to occur in the location of work. The timing, again, we want it to be sort of at the beginning of the shift, but not, maybe not so early that we uh, don't have some of the things prepped. So we really have to think about when that time, um, what time is best for that huddle. Who's going to attend the huddle? Typically, it's all the people in that unit will attend the huddle. Sometimes one person has to peel away to, to do some um, do the work or, or scan a patient if they happen to come down at that time. But we try to have as many people at that huddle as possible. Um, also, we want to make sure that leaders visit the first um, huddle. Um, and so that there has to be a way or a, a process for having um, leaders come out to to attend the huddles on occasion. So when I implemented this, I try to go as much as I could um, to these huddles. And, um, and it wasn't always necessary because uh, or possible because I was working, but if I had the time, I would come to these huddles and see what was going on. Um, again, we have to establish ground rules, rules and responsibility. There has to be a, an agenda and an escalation process. So the first component of a daily huddle is the S mess. What is getting in the work, way of your work today? That's what the S mess addresses. So any safety issues that have come up, um, methods, and this is something that people don't think about right away. Um, it's the processes that might not be working so well. For example, um, one of the issues that my um, outpatient technologist had when I was at Emory was that sometimes a patient would show up and there was no order scanned into the system. So that put a significant delay while they were trying to get an order um, into the system. So that's the sort of thing that would be addressed in methods. Um, equipment, any equipment that is needs repair or has a failed or is, people have concerns about that would be there um, and supplies issues and staffing issues. So that's one component of the daily um, management system. Another component is um, having that information coming back to the staff about what the daily uh, work volume is, any special needs that you might have for certain patients if they're allergic to contrast or something like that would be put in um, that huddle. This is usually where I start when I'm um, implementing a huddle system. The next step is to think about uh, once people come up with ideas, we have to have a way of um, addressing those ideas and doing projects that, um, uh, quality projects that can improve those things. And once we have those quality projects, we can put our metrics up um, as part of the daily huddle. So say you were looking at the um, start times for IR procedures in CT, and you wanted to track how that was um, going along with your project then you could have um, a sheet that where you write down the day, uh, the time of um, day that you started procedure every day to see how you were doing. So that's a way of tracking it and making it visible for everybody to know that this is what you're working on um, and this is how you're doing. 
Another thing that is discussed in the daily huddle is standard work and confirmation of that standard work. Um, I think you'd be amazed how many times you think things are happening a certain way and you go out to um, visit these, um, the site and you realize it's not happening the way you thought. Um, for example, we had um, an issue where uh, the, I, I came, I was out of the CT scanner and the technologist told me they were waiting for a pregnancy test um, and they couldn't, they were, they didn't have any patients to scan right then because they were waiting on a pregnancy test for a patient and that patient was getting a head CT. Um, so we don't require a pregnancy test for a head CT um, because the uh, risk to the fetus would be negligible. Um, but even though that was the policy, it wasn't being implemented because uh, in the way that we thought it was. So it's a good way to review some of the um, standard processes that we have. Another thing that is um, that we talk about in the, the, the morning huddle is improvement ideas. People who work in the area have great ideas for improvement and we need a place for them to voice those ideas. And then the last thing is to figure out those glitches and talk about the glitches that happen during the day and address the causes. So once you have those morning huddles, what kinds of things do you escalate to the next level? So any safety issues should be escalated to the next level. Um, anything that causes harm is either to the patient or to the employee should be escalated. All good catches should be escalated, including, um, and, and you have to include um, who made that good catch. This, these good catches are really important because if you can catch things before they happen, you can work on them and prevent them from happening again. So these are these require a lot of attention because if um, you, you caught something um, before it happens, that's the best time to address the issue, not when it already causes a safety issue. Any other mess issue, um, MESS issues that delays workflow or patient care should be escalated. Any, any issues that may have multi-departmental organizational impact. For example, if your CT scanner in the ED is down, that is something definitely that other people are gonna wanna know. So before I started this whole huddle process at Emory, I went around to see um, the process in other departments that had already started it. And this is one that I um, visited in um, echocardiography. Uh, and as you can see here, they've got their staffing assignment, their SMS, um, and then their success, success metrics, um, the things that they were following was on um, this side. And then finally, um, the um, workload information uh, for the day. So how many cases they start off with during the day. And when I talked to the manager of this unit, she told me this board is always working. Um, I've been here 30 years and I've tried a lot of things. This is the first thing that actually works. And then she also said that when I bring up issues to tier three, it actually gets solved. So this gives a lot of satisfaction because we can see when, when our suggestions are making an impact, how um, our um, attention to our problems are being solved. So it's very, I think, satisfying as someone working in the unit to, to know that. So what can a daily management system do for our patients and our staff? It ensures the workplace is safe and stable. It improves and manages capacity. So if you see that your capacity, your um, uh, volumes are starting to creep up, you can track that information and, um, and then talk about perhaps ways of addressing it, including additional resources. Um, it reinforces standard work processes, addresses difficulties in meeting the standard work. Sometimes things, as I said, may be what you thought was a good idea to um, address a problem, but it, the standard work process just doesn't work for the um, unit. And then it allows you to adapt and change that if it's not working well. A policy and a procedure is no good if you can't follow it. Um, so this allows you the chance to see how it works in action and then make changes as necessary. And then it also 
um, establishes accountability. And, it, and um, again, one of the, the uh, important things that happens in um, this type of system is that we get a lot of improvement ideas. And when we're uh, starting out with these huddles, some of our technologists or um, the people involved in the huddles may be a little shy. They don't want to talk during their, their um, huddle. Um, so I have a little suggestion box so that people can put their suggestions in the box and it's anonymous. Um, it really, I've got really gotten great ideas this way. Um, and then we can decide which of these suggestions we want to implement. So the way to decide what suggestions to implement or what projects to work on is to use a pick chart. Um, and uh, this is a pick chart here. And it, we want to know uh, how much of an impact that idea or, or um, project would have um, and how much of an effort it is. And obviously, if it's a high impact, low effort um, idea or project, that's something we definitely want to implement. But most things tend to fall into the the, either the high impact, high effort, or the low impact, low effort. And then we get to decide which of these things, uh, and depending on how much um, of an impact and how much effort it is to try. And of course, things that are low impact, high effort, those are probably things we don't want to do right now. So once you have a project going, you can analyze, as I said, the um, how you're doing in that project. For example, if you were looking at how um, patient wait times and you wanted to know how uh, what the things were impacting the patient wait time, you could have a chart that puts the most common reasons for waiting and then fill it in as you have um, patients that have delays. So once you're, um, you go through the tier one huddle, which is, again is a 10 minutes, the one person from each of those huddles um, go to a tier two huddle. So in our department, this was our departmental huddle. Um, we had a tier three huddle that was the hospital huddle. Um, and uh, it's organized in a very similar fashion. You have your SMS now um, that is uh, separated into the, uh, the units that are um, that contribute to this huddle. Um, and you can organize this any which way that you think makes sense for your organization. Here we have some that are that are modality specific, but then we also have units like the tower, which have multiple modalities, but just, a, you know, we had like one CT scanner at the time and one MR. It didn't make sense to have one person from each of those sites come. Um, and they, so we had just one group for, for all of them. And they were a group that was um, very cohesive and helping each other out. So it made sense to have them as a separate unit. So uh, it's also an, another 10 minute um, huddle that involves some of the same elements. You know, Here we have the hospital capacity, um, hospital census, um, any procedures because they do impact all of our um, departments um, or, or, or all of our modalities. Um, here we have a GA procedure uh, listed and the number of those listed for the day because we know how long that takes. Oops. And um, the, then we also have uh, a sign-up sheet for um, rounding schedule. So this is really important because we want, not only do we want the information to flow from the tier one to the tier two, we want our leaders to be out visiting the tier one huddles and in the sites so they can see how the work is is, is happening. Um, and one story I have of this is that when I first started a rounding schedule, um, I had, um, I asked the leadership or the hospital administrators to come with me to our new um, tower uh, location uh, where we had this uh, big safety issue with a door. Um, so when they built the tower, they put in a door for um, to the MR um, suite that was from the control room to the suite that was um, that had a push button to open and close. It seems like that would be a good idea, except that once you push that button, you could not manually move the door. Uh, so if the door was opening, it was going to continue to open. You could force your, put all your weight in it and maybe make it stop. Um, and once that door was closing, it was 
going to close unless you wedge yourself between there. And it was, so you can see how much of a, a safety issue that would be if you had a patient in their coding and you couldn't get in because this door wouldn't open up. Um, and that door had been in place for um, six months. Uh, so I finally had brought by our hospital administrators to show them how big a problem this was. And they agreed it was a huge problem and it was fixed within a week or two. So not so you might be thinking, how would I manage a, a big group of people if they're on different sites? So how would we do a huddle um, when they're in all these different locations? Um, well, you can do a virtual huddle um, and there are um, ways that you can make a huddle board that everybody can contribute to. So this, I use a whiteboard um, software to create this. Um, so you could have people putting in their information before the huddle begins and then going over it together um, through a virtual call. So the great thing about doing this type of work together is that people um, are empowered to solve their own problems and then the solutions are better. And this is a quote I got from David Larson, who's at Stanford. So now I want to talk about standard work. I, I mentioned that standard work confirmation is one of the functions of a daily management system. Uh, so what is standard work? It's the current best known way of doing something. So it may not be the way you intended, but it is the current best known way of doing something. And why do we need standard work? It's, you know, if you don't know if what, if you can't describe what you're doing, you probably don't know what you're doing. Um, so one way I introduce standard work to my CT, uh, our CT technologists is um, we used to have these um, annual uh, CT retreats and I had them, I told them, you know, we're working for a pig drawing factory. We're drawing pigs for a client and I want you to draw some pigs. So they draw some pigs and they're all their pigs look different. Um, but then I give them a procedure, a standard operating procedure on how to draw those pigs. Um, and then now we have these nice pigs that all look the same. So standard work is a way of ensuring that the um, work is, is to the standard that we expect and that um, it's consistent. So quality is all about consistency um, as well as um, about um, the actual quality of the work. Take a sip. So um, if you were listening in on Thursday um, to Dr. Zygmunt, who talked about this already um, to some extent about how we managed our um, dose alerts in uh, at Emory. Um, once, so I had been working on um, dose reduction and, and dose optimization since 2011. Um, so we first started with just trying to audit some some images and see if we needed to, if we could reduce the dose. Um, and then we were part of the DIR, the ACR DIR, which helped us manage and, and track our doses. And then we we finally got a dose um, a dose monitoring software. Um, and with that, we were now able to to look at our our um, track our doses more in real time. Um, so we set a uh, threshold for our protocols and uh, and uh, anything that fell out of it would give us a dose alert. So we used the DIR to benchmark um, what we had and then used um, the um, dose tracking system to alert us for high dose events. So then we were faced with who's going to review these? Who is going to take a look at these and figure out what was wrong with them? And then who, after that happens, who would make the changes? So we came up with a process for doing that. Um, and this is the paper if you wanted to, um, to look at it. Um, and so we were going to have those, um, those alerts that were sent to the um, technologists, have them uh, respond to the alerts first, and then look to see if the protocol that they used for that particular case matched 
what was in the protocol book. And then if it wasn't, they would make the changes. If it was, then the physicists would review and then figure out what was going on um, and see if they needed to review that protocol, uh, re review it with a radiologist to see if that protocol needed to be updated. And then if they did, then we would um, make that update and have the tech change that protocol in the system. So we wanted the technologists to start with the, with the initial review. We sent out, um, we did some training um, that our, our uh, phenomenal uh, medical physicists came out to do on how to address these dose alerts. We sent them um, a template um, that they could just check off the boxes and then they were supposed to email or put the, the information directly into Radometrics. So I think Dr. Zygmunt talked about this, but what he didn't tell you was that initially it completely failed. Uh, the technologists did not send us back any of these. We, we I think we got a handful of them uh, when we started this. And it, when I thought about it, it was it was kind of a lot of work to go through and pull up the case, look at the images, go to Radometrics and find the, the um the protocol, compare the protocol. And then the question also was, you know, how do they know that it's the body habitus that made the dose high here? So I think it was a difficult, even with some guidance to make these decisions for the technologists. So our, um, our medical physicist went through the dose alerts all herself. Um, went through like six months of them and then looked to see what were the most common um, reasons. And mind you, I was, I've been doing this work since 2011. We thought we fixed some of our major issues with our um, protocols. But you can see here that more than 80% of our dose alerts were because the protocol did not match the protocol book. And this is a Pareto chart. And, and clearly the Pareto principle is... Uh, is in effect here where 80 more than 80% is attributable to one particular cause. So then um, our physicist came up with a great idea of the protocol of the week. Oh, um, and when you're thinking about uh, how to address performance, um, performance in a, a group, then you really should think about what is the standard. So did they follow the standard? In this case, we had to develop a standard, right? So we had a standard that we developed that um, they were supposed to fill out this form um, and, and the standard wasn't followed. And we did do some coaching and, and conversations with the, the technologist, but it still didn't work out. And then we wondered, well, maybe the standard isn't correct. Maybe there's a way we can change this. Um, and we thought about how we would improve that standard and then change that standard. So what we came up with was the protocol of the week. So the protocol would be sent to the technologists for an update once a week. So they only had to deal with one protocol a week. Um, and then the technologists were supposed to review and make the changes. They were supposed to sign off that they did it. So this is where you know the check and balance, you know, the accountability comes in in this process. And if they didn't, if we didn't get a response from them. Um, it was escalated to the manager. And each time that we sent out a protocol, if there were delinquent protocols, that would be added to their email. And, you know, you have to do these three and that um, continued. Um, so with that, we were able to, um, so here's, here's when we started with Rata Metrics. We did a pretty good job in the beginning, seeing a drop just from putting the protocol book um, from creating a protocol book, uh, but then we kind of stalled out um, and then we implemented this protocol the week and that um, made some improvements. I think we added another hospital here. So things had changed again, um, but it did have an improvement. And if you look at um, our uh, uh, physicists continue to do those, those um, dose investigations, those high dose alert investigations, and you can see here that we started out at 70% um, and then went down to 13% by 2017. And now I hear it's at six to 7%. So most of the uh, dose alerts are no longer because they don't match our standard. 
So standard work provides a clear process and clear performance expectations. Um, so, and part of what you want to build in that is that the check and balance and the accountability. Here's another example of standard work. Um, this is from a colleague uh, at Emory, um, Matt Hawkins, who was an interventional radiologist. Um, we had a sentinel event where the, the uh, wrong patient uh, received a procedure. Um, and what we did was we went to, to see if people were, you know, everybody says they're doing the universal protocol, but we wanted to see if that was actually happening the way we thought it was. So uh, we had someone come out and just watch uh, and see how people were doing the universal protocol. And they were doing certain elements of most, uh, I think um, all the cases that we reviewed, they were doing most of the elements of the universal protocol, but sometimes they would leave some things out. Um, they may not go back and look at the consent or the order. Um, maybe they didn't do entirely the, the two patient identifier. Um, and so we wanted to come up with a checklist about on how, um, what things we need to, to check off on before we start a procedure. And this was re uh, revised and refined over time. So we didn't just send this out, we had um, training, we had a, a video that showed a, a, a good um, timeout and a not so good timeout. Uh, we had coaches that would come and and watch the procedure happen, watch the time up um, procedure happen and give point feedback on that. Um, so we did put a lot of effort into making this happen. And, and as you know, if you're in an academic institution, people rotate through this all the time. You have new residents, you have new fellows. And so this continually needs to be reinforced. And if we make it into a habit, it's much easier to reinforce than if we have to train them um, do just an annual training that people forget. So I think my colleague here summarized how this helped her the best or, or how this helps the best. She said, the checklist helped me remembers all the mundane stuff so I can worry about the complex stuff. Um, so it's not a burden to go through and do a ch checklist of things um, because you're able to, you don't have to think about it. Um, and that's the the thing, the good thing about doing um, having standard work that is is easy and is automatic like this. So I just want to end the, with a story of um, a teamwork that uh, that brings in some of the elements that we talked about. So this is um, the um, abdominal procedure team. Um, they do their huddle every morning, um, and we have our radiologists, our our um, nurse, um, the CT tech that's the top sign for the day, and our our most probably our most valuable person, our um, APP um, Gail. Um, she's the one who is the glue because she's here every day. The radiologists rotate on a daily basis. The uh, residents rotate on a weekly basis, um, and also the you know the tech and the RN also rotate. So she's the glue, and one week. She was out of town, and usually what she does is she will, um, when she gets a call about a procedure, she will um, fill out a form um, detailing what we're doing for that procedure, um, and then put them in these little bins for each day of the week. So she was out of town, um, and a procedure, it was a very busy week, a very busy day, and one of the procedures that was on an inpatient was bumped to the next day. So now we have a new crew of people, and um, it was on, uh, it was a lung nodule biopsy. And when the person who on that day reviewed it, they thought that from based on the notes and everything that they were supposed to biopsy the largest lesion on the left. Um, but in fact, what they already knew what this was and they wanted a biopsy of the one on the right. So uh, they're all prepped and draped consented, the patient, I don't think, really knew which one issue was supposed to happen. Um, and when he was just about, to, the proceduralist was just about to um, to start the procedure, the tech from the day before ran by and said, wait, stop what you're doing. Because she had been in the huddle the day before and knew that this was not the correct size. She came in, she stopped the procedure, they reprepped, they consented everything, and then started again. So what happened here? So let's talk, think about our performance 
um, questions. Was the standard followed? Well, it wasn't because what happened was there was no sheet of paper. Um, because Gail was out of town, no one, uh, um, usually the responsibilities that our APP has ends up falling to our trainee and they rotate through. So they weren't aware that they had to fill this out. Um, so it wasn't filled out. So, um, so that's one thing, you know, maybe we should come up with a way of, of uh, you know, orienting the resident when they come on. Um, so they talked about what sort of things they could do to improve the process in the next huddle, um, having some clear expectations for the training, having a guide on what they're supposed to do on the service, um, especially if Gail is gone. Um, and then perhaps a sign out from the day before would also help with the situation. Uh, so in summary, um, we talked about daily management systems and that how it can improve communication because it brings all that information out into the open, it makes problems more visible, um, can establish and reinforce standard work processes. So when you're talking about it in the day, you may find out that um, certain things aren't working out and make those changes to the work process. And it empowers the frontline workers to create better solutions um, to, conf to confront their uh, work. And that leads to a better and safer working environment. So I will say that the keys to success um, for this is to have a leadership commitment. So one of the, I had actually been trying to implement the daily management system for a while at Emory, but it wasn't until our um, CEO um, made this a priority and wanted and provided the resources to make this happen. So they had a consulting firm come in and, and actually do the coaching, which was really helpful. Um, there, you know, you need time for training, uh, for coaching and for practice and development. This can be done in a smaller scale, but it does need some resources. Um, there has to be some patience that we're trying to learn as we're going um, by doing. And then there needs to be some discipline so that we stick to the 10 minute time rule uh, and make sure that things don't end up spilling out into our workday. So I think that this, uh, what this gives people is a really a sense of connection to their work environment and a way to work with, with, with pride. So thank you. Um, and I will take any questions that you might have now. And thank you for that amazing talk. Um, I can't imagine someone seeing this talk that doesn't have the kind of program in place in their own hospital <clears throat> I can even imagine how to begin. I so think do you have any tips for sites that want to sort of start from a place where they don't have this kind of organization or hierarchy in place? Um, I love the protocol of the week. It, it, it feels like a, a piece that I can understand implementing. But what tips do you have mm -hmm. for people who are starting without any of this kind of systematic approach in place? I think the best thing to do is to go see how other people do it. And I spent a lot of time doing that before we even started. So we went to Stanford, we spent a day um, with David Larson at Stanford and his team uh, watching on how they did this. And they started a, different, a little bit differently. They started by building the capacity for quality improvement first. So they trained people in quality improvement and then they implemented the daily management system. Um, so that's what I would say is start out with that. And then you have to create, you, you know, the business case for this. And one of the things I did before I even started this was show how much um, Stanford was saving um, in terms of money um, by improved efficiency, by um, mostly by improved efficiency, but uh, the ways, the return on investment of this. And it, they had a staggering, you know, they were tracking all of that. So they had saved, I think, $5 million. That was their estimate in all the quality projects they were doing. So I think that is how you start is making the business case for it, seeing how other people do it. Um, you know, Emory now has, has some of this going on. Um, and, but I think, you know, Stanford has, has, you know, David's great and he's really, <laughs> you know, the, and when, and the thing that really struck me that really made me want to do this when I went there was their staff is so happy. Hmm. 
Right. I think empowered people in general feel very happy. Um, I, I wonder if, did you go to visit Stanford as part of an organized program or did you just sort of work through your friendship with David to allow him to come? Like, is there a formal process? When, when I was a resident and a researcher at UCSF, we used to have a visiting program in the radiology program where the department, where people would come from all over the world to visit for different uh, not, 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 not for this. Not, not for quality and safety. Right. I don't think we have anything like the work that Stanford does it in educating how to do this. But it, it, how, how would people do this? How do they, how do they get this exposure that you're saying is so important? Yeah. So I did. It was through. It was an informal thing. I asked if I, um, you know, David. Uh, Stanford has a summit, a quality improvement summit that usually runs every year, um, usually around February. Um, and I asked to show up the day before and and watch what they were doing um there he did have a program um on the quality improvement side of things of how to how to manage quality improvement projects so that was a little bit different but i wanted also to see the daily management part of it um so i showed up there i know that um virginia mason has some programs on this so you a formal program on on um, doing daily management and quality improvement. Um, so they you can get a formal training through for them. Um, and of course, there as I said, there there are some consulting companies like Simpler that does the coaching and the um, training for you. Um, so we were really fortunate to be part. We actually asked as a department to be part of that because they were going to roll it out elsewhere, and we made the case that. We touch everything in the hospital. We, we, we're like central in the hospital. If we don't run well, you know, you're not getting your scans and, and things, you know, and, and your patients stay longer. So we made a case that we really needed this, um, this training and this help early on. Fantastic. Super helpful. Um, I had one other question that I think maybe I'll just leave out on the table for your next talk, because I think it pertains to that, which is... I heard some ideas of how you empower technologists who weren't used to or comfortable speaking up, you know, that you had sort of a, a, a box of questions where they could sort of share their ideas. But maybe in the next talk, you can sort of help us see how to really help empower technologists mm -hmm. to lead some of this work. They obviously have sort of um, a whole lot of experience, but not necessarily the same experience speaking up and being listened to. So right, a good segue to your next talk, or yeah, yeah. I'm, I will be talking some about that. I think the key, at least with the daily management piece, is that, um, and my next talk is shorter, so mm -hmm. <laughs> so I won't be going uh, quite as long. But um, the key is that um, when when you're doing the huddles, uh, I make it's we make sure to rotate who's leading that day. Uh, now, when I tried to implement this at, at Utah, it didn't quite work as well because we had a manager who really made it difficult for that to happen. Um, he kept trying to lead. He kept butting in and saying, you know, we can't, oh, no, we can't do that. Uh, <laughs> and that's not really helpful. Um, that's not going to empower anybody to speak up if you, if you say, well, no, you can, you know, if you.